From Mountain Home to Raft River, we've got all the District 4 analysis you'll need to know. This is the Magic Valley PrepCast with Scott Burton. That's right. That's right. It's the Magic Valley PrepCast on IdahoSports.com. Brandon Bainey and the guy who's bobbing and weaving on your screen there, that's Scott Burton. What's going on, Scott? Oh, just uh, listening to the catchy opening tune that we got going on there. Kind of got me out of my seat a little bit. Yeah, if that doesn't get you fired up for some podcasting, I don't know what will. <laughs> I agree 100%. No doubt. So this is the Magic Valley Prep Cast where we break down everything going on in District 4 in the state of Idaho each and every week. Uh, Brandon Bainey with Scott Burton, IdahoSports.com broadcaster, also the athletic director at Jerome High School. You can get this podcast a couple of different ways, audio mm-hmm. only at IdahoSports.com and wherever you download your podcasts. Video version as well. If you want to see Scott's finest uh, patriotic gear here, uh, American flag hat and a nice uh, Army T-shirt, you can see that on the video version of this at IdahoSports.com's YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. Where'd you get that shirt, Scott? Oh, I got it. Uh, Where did I get it? Uh, (laughs) But a buddy of mine was in the Rangers, and uh, so he – obviously has a plethora of those kinds of things. And um, by kind of when I was in college, uh, kind of trained with them for a little bit because I had a buddy in the Rangers and he took me with him and I did a lot of that kind of, that kind of training. And so I got some swag. So That's this, awesome. Yeah. Kind of old, but it still works. Yeah. Sometimes the older things are better, a little more simplistic, right? Not mm-hmm. quite as a little, little tighter than it used to be. Let's put it that way. <laughs> 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 that's because you've been working out. You're, you're yeah, that, that's through. exactly that's what I'm going to go with as well. Right. Well, let's let's work our way through the rundown here on this week's prepcast. We're going to tackle wrestling and boys and girls basketball. Uh, let, let's start with wrestling because the, one of the signature events in the state of Idaho took place last week. Uh, the annual Raleigh Lane Invitational at the uh, Idaho Center over in Nampa. Um, this is a uh, usually a pretty it, teams, especially five A four A teams that go over there and do well typically perform well at state as well and the magic valley had a couple of individual champions as well which is very impressive considering the the big field that presents itself there oh yeah no question about it this this tournament is kind of the the precursor to state it gives you the environment that uh, you're going to be kind of tasked with at the state tournament whether it's here or whether it's a toll arena uh, it doesn't matter it's the same environment and so if you can kind of control yourself and your emotions and your adrenaline and all those kinds of things. This really does give you a really good litmus test uh, for the state tournament. And so we do see a lot of kids that do well at the Raleigh lane end up doing quite well at state as well. Yeah. From a team perspective uh, in the boys competition, Minico took sixth place overall with 127 and a half points. That was the best among four a schools, which uh, bodes well for that Spartan program. That's gunning for a state title. Uh, There was also a girls competition as it's now officially sanctioned by the state of Idaho. Um, And we didn't see any teams uh, because like you, we said a couple weeks ago, it's hard to fill out an entire roster right now to, to really factor into the team race. But we did see a couple of individuals uh, have some standout performances. Uh, And right away, I want to, I want to point to Lita Cruz from Minico. Uh, She won the title at 106 pounds. Very impressive. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I think everybody's still getting used to the idea of what kind of person is a female wrestler, you know, I mean, that that's not meant to, to, to slide one way or the other on the gender sexism, anything like that. It's just a different, if it's, it's a different sport, it's a different animal. It's a different type of, of mindset, you know, to be a wrestler and even growing up, I mean, it was like wrestlers are, man, they are just cut from a different cloth. And now all of a sudden we've, we've got a strong contingency of girl wrestlers that are really doing well. And so it, it does make you wonder kind of what are they like? I mean, are they just the kind that go out and just beat the snot out of boys on the playground when they were growing up or, or, or what is their deal? And so, you know, and Lita coming in at 106, you know, you talk to the people that, that know her, they will just tell, tell you that she is, is about as calm and happy as any person you'll ever meet. You know, it's not like she's walking around with this anger and this chip on her shoulder or anything like that. It has to be. She's just calm and happy go lucky. And, you know, she doesn't get too hyped up or overly nervous when she has to wrestle. She just goes out there and and does her thing. But, you know, for for her, I think one of the cool things is that she was pretty much raised in the wrestling room. You know, I mean, as, as a toddler, that's where she was. So, I mean, 
the wrestling mat, man, that is just second nature to her. And uh, it was really cool to see her do so well, uh, you know, for the Magic Valley and for Minico High School. But, uh, you know, she's one of those integral pieces of the Minico program, boy or girl, that uh, when you talk about uh, Lita Cruz, everybody's got a story about her. And uh, usually it's about them getting her butt whooped by her, you know, because she is just one of those kids. And uh, I was really happy to see her do so well. Yeah, that was really awesome. Uh, that was a tough weight. She beat uh, Alistair Dillo from American Falls. Um, Kira Zimmerman from Moscow took third, and and her sister uh, Skyla Zimmerman won at one thirteen. That that's a prominent wrestling family from Moscow. So to to beat out a Zimmerman from Moscow uh, and a good wrestler from American Falls, pretty impressive for uh, Lita Cruz. The other individual champ came on the boys' side, and it came from Gooding. It's it's really unusual for three A and lower athletes to win individual titles at Raleigh Lane because you've got 5A schools, you've got 4A schools, you've got schools from Washington and Oregon and Montana coming down to compete. And so for Tate Gillette from Gooding to win the 152 pound title, I mean, that's just awesome. Yeah. Tate, you know, is one of those kids. He's just one of the all American hardworking farm kids that uh, are just kind of a dying breed these days. You know, those are the kind of kids that I grew up with you know, in Southern Idaho here where the athletic teams were a reflection of that. And, and Tate's one of those kids that is just embodies that entire work hard, play hard down to his country roots. I mean, he's just one of those kids and you can't help, but root for the guy and his success is, is just off the charts. I mean, you know, he's going after, I believe it's his third state title. Uh, he's obviously got a name in the wrestling circle. Um, but, you know, he's, he's also one of those kids that had a lot of motivation coming into this because, you know, he was um, he lost in overtime last year in this tournament. So, I mean, this was a big tournament for him coming in. And, um, you know, a little fun fact on the tournament, over the thousand wrestlers or so that were at this tournament, you know, he was the highest team point scorer because he just kind of pinned his way through the in, entire tournament. So, you know. Good for him. I mean, he won this thing and he won it in dominating fashion. And uh, yeah, it, it goes to your point about, I mean, here's a 3A kid going up against these 5A, 4A kids and just breezed right through him. But that's the toughness of Tate Gillette. And if you remember, you know, following any of the football games that we did, you know, we're calling his his number all the time because he was one of those linebackers that was just in on every play. Tough, hard-nosed kid, um, great work ethic. And, uh, you know, people have nothing but good things to say about this kid. Yeah, he defeated Gabe Lake from Flathead High School in Kalispell, Montana. That That's like a 5A Idaho school. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like you said, he dominated 17-2 to two in that championship match. I mean, oh, just, yeah. And, well, I mean, the thing about Tate is, is he has got some of the strongest hands that you're going to see. And so his wrist game, I guess, is, I mean, he gets a hold of your wrist, you're done. Uh, because he's going to turn you. And, and that's just how he is. And, you know, you get him, you know, on the on the bottom, he's he's got one of the best switches around, too. So, I mean, this is a kid that is going to be fighting for a state title. And uh, yeah. And in that championship game, yeah, he got the fall uh, because he got uh, his guy to step where he wanted and nailed him with his uh, little his fireman. And next thing you know, it was done. And uh, Tate's got some skills on the wrestling mat. Tough kid, but he's also very technical on the wrestling mat too he knows what he's doing yeah that was so awesome to see him uh break through and and get a win uh, against uh, a lot larger competitors in terms of school size so uh congrats to tate gillette and lita cruz from gooding and minico individual champs at the raleigh lane invite uh speaking of great careers you talked about tate gillette and his great wrestling career let's let's switch now to basketball and a couple of great careers that are uh, going to be wrapping up soon, but we're seeing all of these milestones continually get broken. We saw Amari Whiting a few weeks ago become Burley's uh, single game point score record holder and also the all-time career record holder now for most points in a career. And we talked, uh, I think it was either last week or the week before, but we said, you know, keep an eye on Mountain Home because Brandon Bethel, four-year starter at point guard for the Tigers, um, is getting close to the to the thousand point barrier, which is a pretty significant milestone for for any high school basketball player. Well, he was able to cross that threshold last week, and uh, congratulations are in order for Brandon Bethel from Mountain Home. Yeah, and if you and if you don't know this kid's journey, I mean, it's to get a thousand points. I mean, you've got to be a 
really realistically a four year varsity player. You know, I mean, otherwise you're scoring ridiculous amounts of points a game and you're going to end up <laughs> D1 school somewhere. But, you know, but Brandon's journey has been really interesting because, you know, Brandon's the point guard, the coach's son as well. And so with that comes a lot of responsibility, a lot of pressure, uh, not just being the coach's kid. That, that really has nothing to do with it, but being a point guard and what everybody feels a point guard should be doing. Because, you know, stereotypically, we think of point guards as those who distribute the basketball, not score the basketball, you know. And, and this was a journey that, uh, that Brandon took along the way. And it was really interesting to see him take this journey because as a freshman, his role was not to score. You know, he was told as a freshman to limit turnovers, get the ball to the older guys and play defense. That was his role as a freshman. But even with that, he still took his shots because he was a freshman, didn't know any better, and even had a couple of 30-point games as a freshman. But uh, he averaged just over 11 as a freshman. But he, he was still trying to figure out how to be the point guard and distribute. Well, his sophomore year, it got really frustrating for him because he thought as a point guard, you shouldn't be the leading scorer. Now, this is where all that stereotype comes in as being the floor leader, the floor general. And he thought, you know, his job was to, you know, make his players around him better and not really score. The problem was they didn't have the players that could score. And so it took him a little bit um, to get him to start taking those shots and become one of the scorers and, and to be a little bit more selfish as the point guard of sophomore year. And so it was a really kind of a, a growing season for him. Now he still did quite well, but he's still settling into kind of what his role is. Um, but his junior year, it really clicked. You know, this was a, this is a kid who finally got it. And uh, he, he understood the balance between being a scorer and a point guard. You know, he did his best to get the other kids involved, um, but he also understood that his team wasn't going to win unless he started taking shots. But there's a difference in the mindset of knowing you have to take the shot versus well, am I supposed to take this shot? You know, and he finally got it together. And, you know, by this time, he, everybody knew who he was. And so they're playing box and one on him. They're, they're, you know, guys in his grill, 90 feet. I mean, it's just, he can't get a break. And so he still finished with a 14 point average his junior year. And then this year, um, he really embraced the challenge. You know, it's funny because they told Brandon at the beginning of the season, it's like, Hey, you know what, this thousand point thing, that might be a realistic thing. And he just kind of looked at everybody. I didn't really know kind of what that was all about. And um, because I think his team was a little bit more excited about it than he was, you know, just kind of one of those kids that just loves the game of basketball to get out and play. And then when he, when he eclipsed the record, um, you know, talking to his dad, uh, it was like just seeing him smile and blush on the floor when he did it uh, was worth it all. Uh, just a humble kid. And, you know, and he's also a kid that's never missed a practice, never missed a game. You know, so congratulations to to Brandon on that milestone. That's quite impressive. And especially knowing the journey and the maturation process that he kind of underwent as a basketball player. Pretty cool. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned his dad, Brian Bethel, the, the head coach. He's been there 10 years now, and he's he's carved mm -hmm. out a nice career at Mountain Home um, where, you know, talk about Mountain Home. It's a community that uh, has a lot of transplants uh, because it's right there by yep. – uh, is it an Air Force base? Yep. Yeah, okay. it's the Air Force base. Yeah, so you get families moving in and out all the time. And so to have a coach that's been there for 10 years and a point guard that's been there for four years, that's mm -hmm. really uh, some good kind of stability for a program that doesn't always have it. Yeah, you know, and I was talking to, and it's funny you bring that up because I was talking to some coaches from Mountain Home this past week about that exact same thing. And and uh, what I was told was that, yeah, it, it, it's a weird place to coach just because you do get those transplants and they're some of them are gone after two years. But where they told me that it really kind of gets them the most is in the younger grades, uh, because by the time they get out to the high school, they're they're there. Right. It's they see a lot of turnover in the pre high school years, which makes it a little bit more difficult to get youth programs established, you know, and that uh, that those that group of kids that just plays together throughout the years. You know, that's been an issue. You know, and so a lot of times they're getting out to the high school and they just, you know, never have played before together. 
you know, so it was really interesting to hear that perspective of it because I think everybody's got their idea of, of kind of what it's like to be in mountain home, but until you're there, you don't know. So I thought I found that really interesting. Yeah. And uh, I, I thought it was really cool. Once Brandon broke that thousand point barrier as well, Brian called the timeout. So the fans could kind of stand and applaud and, and, you know, they could really take in the moment as well. So I thought that was kind of a cool deal. Mountain home is a team. They're still fighting. You know, they're six and five overall. They're two and one in the conference, just a game behind Jerome and Minico, who are both still unbeaten. They had a tough loss at Highland last Saturday where uh, Ezra Godfrey scored a layup at the buzzer and Highland won 41 to 39, which was a tough one. But for Mountain Home, they they still have a chance, and, and it all starts Friday night with a big game at Minico. Winner of that game is in a prime position to challenge for one of the top two spots. Yeah, no, for no question about it. Mountain Home boys are just one of those teams that can d you up. They uh, they had their hands full last night with Jerome, and and got beat pretty good. But they are also one of those teams that can beat you on any given night. You know, because they know how to play defense and they have a scorer in in Brandon, you know, so that Minico game becomes huge because Minico has really been one of these weird teams that you don't know what you're going to get because they have just been with Brevin without Brevin, with Brevin without Brevin. You know, we know what they're going to do. Minico is they're going to ugly it up, slow it down and just make it unbearable to watch and even play. The question is, are they going to have anybody that can score the basketball in Minico? Well, that's where Brevin comes in, and he's really day-to-day all the time uh, with his broken hand. So uh, for Mountain Home, that becomes a really big, big game. And especially from a team like Mountain Home that can get wins on the road, those are huge because Mountain Home is a really weird place to play. Uh, it's a smaller gym. And the environment is just not – it's just not like anywhere else in the conference. And so I really think Mountain Home has a, a a nice home court advantage because of the environment that they're in. And so when you get road wins, and now they got to come to your place, uh, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good trade right there. So big game, you're right. Yeah, they're a bit of an outlier uh, geography wise as well. They're right there on the edge of really closer to Boise almost than the teams in its conference. So a little bit of an advantage there too, in terms of travel when they get to play at home. So, Oh yeah. Imagine how it was for them in the uh, 10 team conference. Three yeah. years ago, they had to go to Preston in the same conference. That's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. That's uh, that's a little far for sure. Um, all right. Another team that can play really good defense on the boys side is Wendell. Let's talk about the, you know, we've talked about Wendell a couple of times on the podcast this year. They just keep winning. They've, they've had some tight games. They've had some good defensive performances. Their latest victory came over a Buell team that's really good in the 3A ranks. They won 46-44. to 44. Diego Torres scored at the buzzer for the Trojans, and they are now 8-1 and one on the season. Yeah, boy, what a what a big win. And there were a lot of little tiny storylines going on in this game, too, because, uh, you know, Diego Torres, who hit the game winner, you know, he had been battling injuries all year. You know, in fact, uh, at halftime, he was ready to be done. His hip was hurting him so bad that and he wasn't playing well. And and uh, he ended up staying in the locker room at halftime, you know, trying to figure out if he could even go in the second half. And well, so they get out there and in the first minute of that second half, uh, Bodie French goes down, rolls his ankle. And so now all of a sudden they've got their two guys hurt. And it's, what are they going to do? And so, you know, both of those players went down to the trainer in the locker room and, and, uh, the bench meanwhile, just battled, um, Zade, Aiden and Carson for those guys. I mean, they kept him in the game while Bodie and Diego were getting treated. And, uh, it was just kind of one of those weird things. Are they going to be able to come back? Are they not? Well, both, Diego and Bodie came back and uh, they were able to play the second half all banged up and they played pretty well. So anyway, it was nip and tuck and they go down to the final possession of the game and it was the last play of the game and Wendell calls time up time out and they drop a play. Well, Buell and head coach Dan Wynn, who's been around forever, comes out in a different defense and it wasn't what Wendell was expecting. And uh, Coach Kelsey told me, he goes, you know what? I probably should have called timeout, but I didn't. Our players improvised. And so what happened next, that was all on our players uh, because they they recognized that whatever they drew up was not going to work. And uh, so they kind of made it on their own. Diego uh, Bodie threw a great pass to Diego, cutting the basket, made it. Jim went nuts and uh, and the rest was history. 
Yeah, it's so awesome. And and for Buell, they just can't they can't seem to find the luck. They're three and seven overall, but they they're good. I mean, they lost to Wendell by two on that buzzer beater. They lost to Kimberly last night, 54-52, another two-point loss. They lost to Marsh Valley, the defending 3A champs, by only 11. They lost to Snake River by one. They lost to Snake River a second time by just seven. So, I mean, this is a team that's close, and you you can see it with Coach Dan Wynn, and they've, they've got good potential. If they can just get it figured out, um, they could be one of those teams that sneaks up on everybody. Yeah, there's no question about it. And games like this give them confidence, you know, give them – you know, motivation and give them that sense of, of just like, Hey, we're headed in the right direction. You know, buzzer beaters are just demoralizing on the other end because you were just a second away from, from winning something. And now all of a sudden you just got this awful taste in your mouth and you don't know what it did to you in the standings. Um, but yeah, this was huge, huge for Wendell and they celebrated big time. Um, you know, so they, I, I asked, uh, you know, Coach Kelsey about kind of, hey, what's going on now with North Fremont? Because that game's kind of right around the bend there. And uh, we both know how good of a program North Fremont is. And uh, just kind of with a smile, just I don't want to talk about it. He's like, we got Declo. We got Declo. One game at a time. And so that's the kind of message that he is telling his boys. And uh, so far it's working. Yeah, they play. So we're recording this Thursday, January 13th. They play mm-hmm. Declo tonight. And yep. then Friday, they travel to Ashton to play North Fremont. They're actually at Declo, and then they'll be at North Fremont. Um, that'll be a good game because North Fremont is another team that's they're nine and one. Wendell is eight and one as we're recording this. And again, if you're listening to this tomorrow, just go to idahosports.com. You'll see all the updated scores and standings and, and all that good stuff. But North Fremont is a team that's bona fide, you know, gonna be at state. Wendell mm-hmm. was a team that made it to state last year. They want to get back this year. This could be one of those previews of a potential state tournament matchup. Oh, no question. And you know, for North Fremont, you know, they've got Jordan Lance up there who's who's a really good player and um you know for wendell the last time they played they didn't uh, I, I don't think they had diego when they played last time and so this is something that uh you know they would love to have back at full strength and take a good shot because you know they they respect north fremont and when you talk to you know wendell about the north fremont huskies it is nothing but respect for them because they understand the powerhouse uh, that uh, North Fremont is in basketball. So they're like, hey, we just hope we're at full strength and we hope we can keep it close and and, and give them a good game. Yeah, that's Wendell's lone loss of the year came to North Fremont back on December 3rd, 60 yeah. to 42, the final there. Uh, girls basketball, as we take a look, the, the big matchup everybody was looking at this week was Burley, Mountain Home, the rematch. Burley won pretty convincingly the first time. We were hoping for maybe a closer outcome, but but Burley once again showed that, hey, we're, we're the premier team in this league as they defeated Mountain Home on Tuesday night by 20, 54-34. Yeah, and this game was a lot closer than the score indicated, too, because, I mean, it was nip and tuck all the way. It was a six-point game at the half and then only a three-point game in the fourth. And then all of a sudden, the wheels fell off, and uh, Amari Whiting ended up shooting 22 free throws, you know, for the game. And, it, and uh, Sadie Drake fouls out for Mountain Home. And so it was just one of those things. But, you know, it, Burley battled foul trouble as well. I mean, they had uh, like four girls on the floor, I believe, uh, with four fouls. And yeah, they did in the fourth quarter with four fouls. So they were playing a little timid as well. So fouls played a huge role in this game. Obviously, if somebody's shooting 22 free throws, one person, and then uh, Mountain Home loses one of their, their top players. Uh, it was just one of those things that uh, Burley just took off in the fourth quarter fortunate to get a win and um it was a huge road win because like we talked about just a little bit ago mountain home still plays play yeah very tough uh with that loss they it dinged him a little bit in the max preps rankings uh i think they were third or fourth going into the game they dropped down to seventh after that loss and again um in terms of representation at state that's all predetermined but once the eight teams are in they will be seated one through eight based on the max preps rankings so that'll be something to keep an eye on as we progress towards district tournament time so uh but for mountain home could be encouraging if, if they were to face burley possibly a third time at districts oh absolutely i mean mountain home has all the tools i mean they've got the height which is something that you can't really coach so much in in girls basketball and 
boys for that matter too sometimes, but they, they have the size, they have the length. Uh, they've got a couple of shooters. They've got a point guard. They're going to be okay. They're going to battle anybody. But, you know, you look at the two teams in this conference right now, it's, it's burly head and shoulders right now above everybody else. And then it's going to be Mountain Home. And then who's going to challenge Mountain Home? Is it going to be Minico? Is it going to be Twin? Um, is Jerome going to get it together? You know, what – or Canyon Ridge for that matter. I mean, who is it going to be? Because right now you look at it, all of it points, Burley, Mountain Home. So somebody better step up and challenge Mountain Home for that second position. Yeah, right now Twin Falls maybe appears best equipped, 9-5 and five overall, 5-2 five and two, uh, mm-hmm. in the conference. Uh, we'll see. They play Mountain Home next Wednesday – January 19th at Twin Falls. That'll, that'll be a big game um, for them, for sure. They, they lost to Mountain Home pretty decidedly earlier this year, but you never know how things change over the course of a year. So uh, the last uh, girls basketball note we wanted to hit before we get out of here is uh, a couple more milestones. We talked about Brandon Bethel crossing the 1,000-point barrier. Well, Ashley Boats did the same thing for Camas County. And I think in the rundown, Scott, I said Laura Thompson crossed 1,000 rebounds. That was not correct. 500 rebounds. 500. Yeah, five hundred. <laughs> you probably it's saw a lot. Any way you look at it, I mean, it's what a trillion billion. What's the difference? It's a huge number, right? Yes, but but how incredible is this? We talked about in our season preview. Camas County is the type of team that you know has like six players, and they're not sure on any given night if they're going to have enough. Uh, when they do five on five in practice, they've got chairs as defenders and and kids and assistant coaches acting as defenders. So to have two players for for a school as small as Canvas County cross these big milestones. I mean, that's really uh, incredible. Yeah. I've always found it really interesting how these small schools prepare, because like you said, you don't get that scrimmage time in practice. You know, it is a completely different style of coaching. And I mean, you take any of these smaller schools and, and the way that they coach practice versus some of these bigger schools and the way they coach practice, Sometimes it's completely different just because of the players that you have or don't have for that matter. And uh, Camus is somehow getting it done. So, yeah, you bet. Ashley was knocking on the door. You know, she's a senior right now, obviously, averaging just over 15 points a game. Um, But the thing about her is that she dislocated uh, her shoulder in Vegas. And so she's got this really badly torn labrum. And she's going to have surgery after the season But it's really affected her because um, she, I believe it was, she played left-handed in volleyball. I mean, that that tells you something. So she couldn't swing. So she just flopped it over and played left-handed. You know, so that's the kind of toughness that that this girl has. And, you know, if you're going to eclipse a thousand points, you better be tough because you know people are coming at you every single night. You know, and she's the only, only the fourth girl in, you know, their school history to accomplish this task. But, uh, you know, the cool thing about Ashley is that she's, she's not just a score. You know, she is a good defensive rebounder. She has led the team the last three years uh, in defensive rebounding, you know, and her current rebounding career total is 441. So, I mean, it's right there as well. You know, she's averaging almost nine rebounds a game uh, to go along with five steals. So when you talk about this uh, scoring, yeah, I mean, we have all these Allen Iverson scores, but that's all they do. But you got somebody here that is a pretty balanced player on both sides. And she's committed to go play at Mount Mary University in South Dakota uh, to get a teaching degree, play some basketball for the Lancers. So she's got her her career in pat or in place. You know, she's a 4.0 student. You know, she's already completed one year of college, you know, and the accolades that she has kind of gotten from her team and from the from the state. I mean, she's second team all state offensive player of the year for District 4, 1A, D2, you know, team MVP, student of the year for Camas County. You know, I mean, I love highlighting these people because they're not just great athletes or great people and they're doing the right thing and heading in the right direction. And that's that's Ashley Bose. Yeah, I, I told the story on our season preview, but uh, last year I got to cover the 1A D2 girls basketball state tournament for IdahoSports.com, and Camas County qualified for just the second time in school history. The only other time was 2001, 
and uh, their head coach is Ashley's dad, John Boats. And I was talking to him like, hey, this is exciting. You get to state and maybe you start to develop something. And he goes, honestly, I don't know if we'll have enough girls for a team next year. I'm losing two to graduation. I'm losing a third. She's moving to Washington as soon as we're done here at state. And unless I get some eighth graders um, that are fr- going to be freshmen next year and get them to come out, we may not have enough for a team. And I, it, it really it blew me away that, wow, this is the reality of, of small town Idaho athletics, that you could go from state one year to not having a team the next. And I'm glad that they were able to get enough players to, to have that varsity team. Again, it's it's real a real fine line, but um, they're continuing to to perform really well. They're seven and three overall. They're one and zero in the conference. A win over Castle Ford in their conference opener, and I think they've got provided everybody stays healthy. Of course, I think they've got a great chance to get back to state. No, I think they do too. And and if if you don't understand small town sports in Idaho, then you don't understand the struggles that they go through. And it's it's not just facilities, but it's like you said, it's numbers. You know, we, we accommodate in football and make it eight man. We can't accommodate in basketball and make it three on three. You know, so they're still having to field these teams and and somehow try to develop programs that just don't have any bodies. You know, and, it, and it's not from a lack of interest in these programs. It's just from a lack of humans in the area. And so it, it, it's just a battle that, you know, some of these bigger schools just don't understand sometimes. Yeah, and let's talk about Laura Thompson uh, crossing the 500 uh, career rebounding mark, and and she is, um, she she does a great job technique wise. She a lot of nights is going up against taller competition, but she's she's more than capable of mixing it up down low. Which which is so cool because she's only five six. Yeah, and here she is just pulling these boards, um, and currently I believe she stands at five twenty two, and her season average is a shade over thirteen a game. Uh, six offensive rebounds to seven defensive rebounds, you know, um, talking to coach boats. I mean, she was the first player that he knows of uh, that boy or girl in school history to reach this milestone. And I mean, it it is so cool. And the thing that, that stands out about Laura Thompson is her fundamentals. She is just the fundamentally, stereotypical defender and rebounder that, that you could ask for, you know, and uh, according to coach boats, he's, she's one of the best that, that he's ever had male or female uh, as far as their technique goes and their fundamentals go. And uh, her work ethic is just off the charts. You know, I mean, when you're five, six and you're in there battling and you're pulling all these rebounds, yeah, you better have a work ethic. And she definitely has it. You know uh, the cool thing about her is that she also leads the team in assists from the post position. I mean, think about that for a minute. So, I mean, that tells you that they're running a lot of her off the offense through her and her job is to find the open man from the post, if not score it. And and that takes a special player, you know, because you, you feed it down to a post sometimes boy or girl, and they think, okay, I've got the ball with the block. I need to score. Well, sometimes, no, you don't. Sometimes you find that relocating shooter, you know, to get them in a rhythm. And that's, exactly what Laura does. And she's really, really good at it. You know, she's um, also a pretty dang good soccer player as well, plays for Gooding. And uh, so she's got some skills. I mean, she's another 4.0 student, uh, defensive play, team defensive player in the year for two years in a row. So second team all conference. I mean, th- this kid is, is really fun to watch because she's doing it and she's that big. Yeah. What a year it's been for Camas County, right? The football team had the big upset of North Gem in the opening round of the football playoffs. Mm-hmm. Uh, the girls' basketball team we just talked about. And the boys' basketball team is ranked number one in the whole state for 1AD2. Yeah, what a year. I mean, you, you get these classes that come through, and a lot of times you see it a lot more in the smaller schools than you do the bigger schools uh, because just that – class, that person, that body is doing 15 other things for the school. And if they succeed at one, they're probably succeeding at the other ones too. And so Camus is in this cycle right now that is, it's good for them. I mean, it's, it's gotta be a lot of fun over there in Fairfield. 
Yeah, and uh, it'll be fun to watch them as they go through their conference slate. Uh, still some big games with Dietrich, Richfield, and Kerry. I think mm-hmm. those are the teams that are all going to be kind of fighting with Camas County in, in terms of girls' basketball. But, man, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch them uh, develop. And last year, three teams from that district uh, made it to state, Richfield, Kerry, and Camas County. It would not shock me to see three teams uh, get to state again this year. So. No, not at all. And that's kind of where it's headed right now. So hopefully everybody stays healthy coming down the stretch of the season and uh, hope hope to see those guys again uh, at state and to represent the 4th District well. Yep, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, that'll do it for this edition of the Magic Valley PrepCast. Uh, a, a lot of career milestones to, to talk about this week, which is super exciting. And I've said it, uh, you know, pretty consistently, I, I think pound for pound, the quality of athlete in the magic Valley is unmatched in terms of any other area in the state right now. Oh, I love it here. I mean, this is, this is awesome because we don't have any five, a schools. We have some four a's, um, some three a's, two a's, a lot of one a's. So we, I mean, we are running the gamut from four down to one. And uh, it, it, it is such a cool place to be because the, the quality of kid uh, as you can see through what we <laughs> went through today, uh, they're just really good people. Uh, as well. I mean, I love highlighting all these stories because w- most of the people don't know about, it. you know, outside of Mountain Home. Did you know that Brandon Bethel eclipsed that thousand point mark? Did you know about the two girls in Canvas? You know, I, we don't know those things. And that's why it's so cool to, to bring these stories to you. Um, but what I really like is all of them are really good people. They're good kids doing the right thing, headed in the right direction. Yeah, they're all great students and great citizens mm-hmm. as well. So, all right, we'll have plenty more to talk about again next week as we uh, make our way through January. Girls basketball getting close to that finish line. We'll, we'll have more to talk about again next week on another edition of the Magic Valley PrepCast. Thanks for tuning in. For Scott Burton, I'm Brandon Bainey. We'll see you next time on IdahoSports.com.